So for today, our speaker is Dr. Dan Lenny, who is the Landbury Lead Biologist for SFBBO. So he does a lot of work out at Coyote Creek Field Station, where we band our birds, and he also does a lot of other field work. Um, he has a lot of experience in the field, and he's done research all over the world, from Kenya to Costa Rica. Uh, for his master's at the University of Missouri, Columbia, he studied the effects of forest fragmentation on birds. And for his PhD at the University of Florida, he studied seed dispersal by birds in the cloud forest of Costa Rica. Dan has also studied grassland birds in Illinois, as well as birds in high elevation high elevation meadows in the central Sierra Nevadas here in California. So clearly he has a lot of expertise about birds and ecosystem services provided by them. He also co-edited a book in, that was published in 2016 called Why Birds Matter, Avian Ecological Function and Ecosystem Services. Thanks for signing in, logging on, calling in if that's what you did. Um, I'm not going to go through the book or even follow the sequence of the book at all. I just want to acknowledge um, Sean and Chris, who I worked with a lot on this topic over the past uh, several years. So first of all, I want to do a little bit of Ecosystem Services 101, just to make sure everyone's up to speed and knows what we're talking about, and to set the framework for this, the meat of the presentation later. and. I'll pop, do a couple of pop quizzes along the way just to make sure you're paying attention. Um, then mostly we'll talk about the ecosystem services that birds provide and we won't have time to cover everything but we'll focus on some of the main ones which are pest control, seed dispersal, scavenging and then we might get to some of the other ones uh, depending on, on how the time is. And then at the very end, I'll uh, have a couple suggestions of things you can do if you're interested in doing something. So ecosystem services uh, are, the common definition is that these are ecological processes that benefit humans. Now the, the term is been in, used for about the last 20 years or so, but the concept goes back a lot farther than that. It's, you know, the basic idea that human economy is based on natural resources. Um, and in, in Western societies like ours, you know, that started to you know, become apparent in the late 1800s, early 1900s. In other cultures, it's actually part of the culture ingrained that humans are part of the ecosystem and part of nature. Um, generally, there's four categories of ecosystem services. Um, and you don't have to necessarily remember these. This isn't going to be on the test. But provisioning services are those direct uses of things um, for food, water, you know, wood, um, fossil fuels, and so on. Supporting and regulating services, these are the sort of the ecological things that are happening. Um, the difference between them is kind of subtle, but Supporting services are those that, as the name implies, support other ecosystem services. So for example, soil formation and nutrient cycling lead to um, plant growth that can then be used for agricultural crops. Uh, regulating services are generally things that are um, cyclical, um, but not always. Um, but I'm going to discuss these two together and in some cases it's hard to tell which category certain uh, behaviors go into and we'll get into some of those examples later. And then the fourth category are cultural services and this is kind of an everything else, art, music, uh, religion, education, recreation. Okay, um, and birds of course do all of these things. There's provisioning services that we eat birds, use feathers for insulation, um, bird guano for fertilizer. Cultural services, of course, birds are inspirational for a lot of us and there are lots of examples in art, literature, music, and so on. Um, but mainly what we're going to talk about are 
what birds do in the environment. Those are the supporting and regulating services. So pest control, pollination, seed dispersal, nutrient cycling, and these kinds of things. Let's set the stage a little bit more. And an ecosystem, just as a reminder, is a group of organisms, plants and animals that are interacting with each other and with the physical environment. And these generally occur across broad geographic regions, which you know, you've probably seen maps like this, biomes or the major habitat groupings. And these are characterized by you know, assemblages of species that are more or less particular to a certain uh, habitat or climate or so on. Even if they're migratory and move from one to the other, they're still part of that biome at the time of year that we're in there. Um, so you know, you know, some of these tropical rainforest, desert, um, tundra, taiga, so on. And then within these, there are biogeochemical cycles that both drive the system and join different systems. This is a diagram of the carbon cycle and just to make you, uh, to remind you that at any given time, the carbon is in different places in the environment and depending on the activities in that ecosystem, it could shift the amount of carbon from one place to another. So for example, on the right side of this, um, let's see, do you see that pointer? Fossil fuels, we're basically transferring um, carbon that's in the earth into the atmosphere. And of course that's causing a lot of problems. But you can see on here, there's little mini cycles within the bigger cycle. Um, and there's, this is carbon cycle. So there's also phosphorus, nitrogen, and so on for you know, lots of different things that are in the environment. Now that cycle and all the cycles kind of imply that these are renewable resources. Um, and to a large extent, that's the case, but there are three, at least three, that are not replaceable resources, not renewable on the human lifetime. And those are topsoil, groundwater, and biodiversity. So these could be, and by groundwater, I mean deep water aquifers, not the surface water. Um, so these three categories, um, you know, take thousands and hundreds of thousands of years to replace. So in, in the time frame that's relevant to humans, uh, these are non-renewable resources. Okay, so now we've got the ecosystems, the biomes, um, the biogeochemical cycles, and then at the smaller scale, you have the interacting organisms. And it's typical to arrange those in a food chain or more realistically, a food web, um, like on the right. And these show the, you know, the species um, that interact with each other to one degree or another. Obviously a food web is more realistic, but it's a lot more complicated to do. Uh, the key point here is illustrated by a trophic pyramid like this, where you start at the bottom and you have the primary producers that take sunlight and convert it into uh, plant tissue. Those get eaten by the, the uh, primary consumers, in this case, the rabbits, and the rabbits will get eaten by the predators. Um, it took me a long time to find a diagram, a proper trophic pyramid that shows birds at the top. Usually they have uh, mammals. Um, but in any case, the, the point of this is that when you're doing, um, when you're studying the food chains and food webs, the key, one of the key questions usually is whether the top levels control the system or the bottom levels. And so that's called top down versus bottom up control. And a lot of the ecosystem services studies are based on the concept of manipulating the food chains and the food webs to determine how the interactions work. One of the things we're going to be looking at is whether the top levels, let's just lump the snakes and the eagles together, the effect that they have on the rabbits will then transform down into the plants. And 
if they eat enough of the rabbits, then there'll be less herbivory pressure on the plants, and then the plants will benefit by the presence of the predators. If you remove all the predators, then the rabbits proliferate, eat all the plants, and that could throw things out of balance. Okay, so now we have biodiversity as a non-renewable resource, and ecosystem services depend on biodiversity. Higher levels of biodiversity, that is more species generally, are going to be better for ecosystem services in terms of uh, more efficient delivery of the services and potentially more ecosystem services. And human land use patterns uh, have a big impact or can have a big impact. And one example of that is if you consider the differences in the landscape of conventional agriculture versus ecological farming. Um, I put conventional agriculture in quotes because it's not conventional in the sense that it's traditional, it's conventional in the sense that it's widespread. Um, a monoculture with a lot of chemical input has a lot different impact than say an organic farm with, with hedgerows and, and uh, fallow fields and so on. Okay, so one <clears throat> way to really visualize ecosystem services is to look at examples of where they've totally failed. And one example is in parts of Madagascar, which have had severe deforestation, uh, formerly you know, tropical forest that was cut uh, for one reason or another. And you can see the slide on the right. Um, essentially all the primary producers, the plants are gone. There's a few little patches <clears throat> but the bottom level of the trophic pyramid there is gone. So there's really nothing that can be built on top of that. In addition, you can see the erosion gullies where this system is massively losing what little nutrient is available in the soil into that river, which is gonna go out to the sea. And so this one is entirely out of whack. It's not gonna regenerate without a massive input. Okay. So finally, getting to birds. Birds are a really good group to look at ecosystem services um, because they're highly mobile. They occur in all, virtually all habitats. They readily respond to environmental changes and we can measure that with surveys and so on. Um, unlike a lot of other animal groups, birds are really well known. Uh, even if there's some species we don't know about, we know a lot about uh, related species. And compared to say mammals, which we know a lot about a few mammals, but most mammals are nocturnal and difficult to study. Um, reptiles and amphibians are often at so low density, it's also hard to study them. Um, insects, we even know how many insects and other invertebrates there are. Um, and the final thing is that people generally, or not everybody, but a lot of people have a positive perception of birds, unlike snakes and spiders and things like that, where when we take kids out of the banding station and they see the garden spiders, their initial reaction is to freak out before they realize how cool they are. So birds are a good um, group to study ecosystem services. And most of those services come about because of foraging behavior. Um, after all, that's kind of the main thing that birds do uh, when they're not mating and raising young is that they're looking for food or avoiding being food. And so that could be uh, predation where they're eating other animals or, or little uh, plants in the form of seeds. Uh, pollination, seed dispersal where they're eating the fruits, not necessarily the seeds. Um, scavenging, nutrient, nutrient cycling, all those are behaviors from foraging. Um, the one ecosystem service in the ecological sense um, that's not from foraging is ecosystem engineers and that's when birds modify the environment. Uh, we'll get to that near the end. Okay, so for each of the main groups, um, I'll start off with just a general 
slide that shows some of the players in that particular uh, system and a rough number of species involved. So we're going to start with um, insect or invertebrate pest control. This is the most important thing birds do in terms of the number of species. About 75% of all birds eat invertebrates at some point in their life, even if they don't eat them all the time. But 5,700 species primarily eat insects or invertebrates, and then another 1,700 um, eat, eat them some of the time. So most birds, uh, even birds that you don't necessarily associate with eating insects, will do so, for example, during the nesting season when they're raising young. And you can see on this slide a whole range of <clears throat> morphology from the woodpecker with the sharp bill and the long tongue with little barbs on the tip to uh, the whippoorwill with the really wide mouth and big eyes for foraging in low light situations. Uh, the swift, which pretty much lives in the air, um, catching aerial insects, and then the yellow-breasted chat, which is used to be a warbler, but now it's in its own special group. Um, a huge variety of small little birds that mostly eat invertebrates. Um, now, if you've been doing any gardening, you know that insects can eat a lot of plants. And so the question is, can birds control insects in this context? So going back to our food chain and food web system, we have in this simple example, birds at the top, insects in the middle, those are the herbivores and plants at the bottom. What we want to know is, do birds eat enough of the insects to benefit the plants? That is, reduce insects enough that plant growth is higher. So the way to look at this, the plant is thinking, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So the birds are the enemies of the insects, of course. So one of the earlier studies that looked at this did a really simple experiment is they put a little um, mesh exclosures around uh, twigs and branches of trees. And this is in uh, the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest in New Hampshire and then had some control twigs that were marked, but not with the mesh around them. So the, they had a treatment that excluded birds, but allowed insects and the control, which allowed birds and insects. And not surprisingly, uh, when they counted up the number of caterpillars, Lepidopteran larvae, on the, on the branches, they found um, more larvae on the, the ones where birds were excluded uh, then on the control treatments um, at two key times of the year, one when they're raising young and at the peak of raising young and one later in the season when they're about to fledge. Similar experiment um, added another treatment. So they had a, and they were on whole um, saplings, not just twigs. These were young oak trees, Missouri. They put cages around some trees, no cages around others, and then in a third treatment, they used insecticides to essentially eliminate the insects on those. And then they measured plant growth to see what the effect of that was. So in this case, what they found was um, they measured uh, twig biomass, leaf biomass, and the total of those. The main thing to look at here is leaf biomass, which is in the hatched bars. And you can see that the leaf biomass was high, higher in uh, the spray treatment where they killed all the insects, it's higher in the control treatment where birds were allowed, but it was lower in the cage treatment where birds were excluded. So this is a really nice experiment that showed that the birds are benefiting the oaks through their uh, consumption of the leaf eating insects. So this is an example of top-down effects from the trophic. Um, Pyramid. There have been dozens and dozens of studies like that um, that have confirmed this and extended it to all kinds of systems, including, importantly, agricultural crops. So apples, 
coffee, lots of examples from coffee, broccoli and other row crops. So this, this is really important work because it means that at least in some circumstances you can avoid the use of pesticides and use birds instead. Now you might be thinking, well, birds don't eat everything, so there'll be some damage. And that's probably true to a certain extent, but insecticides don't kill everything either. And that's the key difference between insecticides and birds. So when you're thinking about um, birds eating insects on plants, it's not just one way that the insects are getting killed. It's a variety of ways. So each species is foraging. Some creep along the branches, some look on the underside of leaves, some look on the top side of leaves, some like to look on the petioles. Uh, so there's a whole range of things that the insects have to be um, prepared for, so to speak. They can't evolve defenses against all of those things at once. Whereas an insecticide, it kills everything one way. And so things quickly develop resistance. And we've seen that time and again of, of insecticides and for that matter, herbicides that work for a while and then they lead to these monster weeds and things. Uh, you might also be thinking, well, it's okay in small scale stuff. It's okay in organic farms and nature preserves, but what about conventional agriculture? Um, not much work has been done on this, but Megan Garfinkel, a grad student at University of Illinois Chicago has worked on this and found some interesting results. So again, going back to our system, we've got birds eating the crop pests, in this case, the aphid, um, but also you have to consider there could be invertebrate predators of those crop pests. So the question is, do birds eat the right insects to have a benefit on the crops? So it's a service if the bird, the blue line here, eats the quote unquote, right insect, that is the herbivore, and it's a disservice if the bird eats the predators because that would essentially uh, eliminate some of the pressure on the herbivores. It's also a disservice if birds eat the crops. Um, okay, so this was done in um, north central Illinois. It's a uh, actually kind of a unique area where there's actually some prairie left. A lot of it's restoration, but some of it's remnant. And it's adjacent to some crop fields, both corn and soybeans, which of any of you familiar with the Midwest are the two main land uses there. Um, so similar to other studies and a lot of the you know, food chain food web studies is to use exclosures to fence off part of it and isolate interactions. Um, Megan made little exclosures to cover over sections of the field uh, and measured crop yield at the end of the season. And the first year she found that in corn, um, birds were good. They ate the right insects. They ate the insects that were passed on corn. Um, but in soybeans, they didn't. It was a service. And you can quantify that in economic terms as well, in terms of the crop yield. So it turns out that in the soybean systems, um, the main crop pest was kind of nasty as far as the birds were concerned. And they preferred to eat the spiders, which were the predators of the crop pest. Um, whereas in the corn, um, both the birds and the spiders were happy to eat. Uh, the pest on corn. Now she repeated this uh, in the next year and found interestingly that uh, although leaf damage was higher um, where the birds had access, in other words where they're eating the predators of the insects instead of the herbivores themselves, um, but that didn't translate into a, a difference in grain yield. So this, um, you know, reinforces the idea that in ecological studies, you need to do more than one field season, um, you, know, th you know, three or four, and this is a PhD, so, you know, two is probably all she can do. But, um, you know, we need several years of the study, several sites is, would be better to get a better idea of 
uh, the variability in the system and how then we can use that to our advantage. Okay, so here's your first quiz. This is essentially a monument to insect pest control by birds. Um, and let me see if I can open the chat so I can see your answers. Um, if you have an idea, uh, that didn't work. You can type it in to the chat box, which is, ah, yep, somebody got it. Yep, several people, okay. Yeah, this is in Salt Lake City. It's, uh, I think it's actually just called the Seagull Monument, which is terrible, because there's no such thing as a seagull. But anyway, it's the um, next slide. I gotta go back to this. Here we go. Um, this goes back to uh, the Mormon, early days of the Mormon settlement when crickets, myriads of crickets came down the mountainsides into the valley like a ma vast army marshaled for battle began to destroy their agricultural fields. There's the cricket. Nothing could stop them. Their settlers were hapless. The heavens became clouded with gulls which hovered over the fields they ate, gorged upon the pests. There are the saviors or California gulls. People gave thanks. Surely the Lord was merciful. Surely. Okay. Moving on. Uh, we could look at similar systems with pest control by rodents. Uh, I won't go through any studies of this because they're not as well controlled and not as extensive as with insects. Um, but there's good, there's strong evidence that uh, raptors, hawks and owls in particular uh, can control rodents. Um, it's not clear how strong the top-down effects are though. Um, Next, let's look at seed-eating birds. So we have about a thousand species of these that primarily eat seeds and another thousand that eat them sometimes. Um, again, there's few experimental studies um, about these birds and their influence, actually, surprisingly, um, on this system. I'll just give two examples of things. You've probably heard of this species, the red-bit quailia often considered the most abundant bird in the world, um, now that the passenger pigeon is extinct. Um, it eats seeds, it's hugely abundant, forages around in, in large flocks, um, and the places where it goes depends on where the seeds are, of course. Um, so it's a significant pest in the areas where it is, but it's not in the same area every year. And this bird um, occurs in Africa. But the thing to keep in mind is these birds also eat insects when they're uh, raising young. Um, because they're in big groups and roosts, they um, leave guano under their roost trees, that's useful, and they're also eaten by people. Um, there have been a variety of uh, ill-advised control efforts um, that basically are using poison to massively kill these birds and that's turning out to be a case where the cure is worse than the initial disease. Second example is red-winged blackbird. This is often considered a crop pest, um, especially in the past. Uh, in corn, it can damage um, the seedlings. Um, the thing with red-winged blackbirds is if you look at the agricultural studies, they estimate overestimate crop damage. If you look at ecological studies, they come up with much lower estimates of the damage. Um, so that's one scale of the issue. The other thing is that now we have different varieties of corn that are less palatable. They're planted at different times that don't coincide with when blackbirds are eating seeds. And instead, blackbirds are like the quailia and other um, birds we generally think of as seed eating they shift to eating insects in the summer when they're nesting. And so they're not as much of a crop pest anymore. And there are similar studies 
in rice that show uh, that kind of work. So overall, there are not many studies on other species, but the ones on uh, these two common ones are probably overrating them as crop pests. And some studies from exclosures suggest that mammals and invertebrates are the main uh, predators of weed seeds in agricultural fields, not on crop seeds, but on weed seeds. Um, so we still don't really know if birds have a good role in weed seed control. Okay, scavengers. This is a very important group, but there's not many species in it. Uh, 40 specialized uh, scavengers and then another 300 or so facultative species that occasionally eat um, carrion when they can get it. These of course include the vultures. Um, if you think about uh, your last walk in the park or nature preserve, you might not have seen anything dead. But there's a lot of dead stuff out there. Uh, it just typically gets eaten pretty quickly. Um, and in one study in East Africa uh, estimated that more than half of the ungulates, that is the antelopes and things, um, don't die from the dramatic uh, cheetah takedown or things like that. They die of disease or old age and things, non-predatory deaths. So there's a lot of um, carcasses out there that we need scavengers to take care of. Uh, one way to really visualize this is in India. Um, this is, you know, a bit of a different situation, um, but people there uh, don't kill the cows, they let them die natural deaths, and they try to ease their final years with um, a, um, a pain reliever called diclofenac, which uh, turns out to be highly toxic to vultures. And because there were so many carcasses um, around, basically toxic carcasses, this led to massive declines in the vulture species in India, and a consequent increase in diseases, um, rats, feral dogs, and then a massive increase in human health care costs associated with that. And the other side effect of that was that the a small religious group, one of the older religions in the world actually, Zoroastrians, um, there's a small group of them in India and because of the massive vulture die-off, they couldn't do their normal um, practice of corpse cleansing where they have these towers, uh, put the dead person there and let vultures clean um, clean the corpse before as part of their uh, religious rituals for, for uh, end of life. Um, now this is maybe kind of an extreme example, but it does affect them monetarily too, not to, also uh, culturally, you know, they can't do their practice, plus they have to pay for it, different ways of, uh, of uh, burying people. Um, oh, speaking of vultures, but, um, read this slide and I'll be right back. Okay, so if you read that, um, you can see the condors are useful too. Um, so you know in the pandemic, there's this thing where people put teddy bears in the window to cheer people up when they're walking by. Well, I wanted to join in, but I don't have a teddy bear, but I do have this, a nice, cute, plush vulture that sits in the window and cheers people up when they go by. Um, to compensate for that, uh, I also have this, <clears throat> which I'm hoping people mostly think is an owl, uh, but it's actually a plush microbe called Streptococcus pyogenes, which is 
also known as breast eating disease. But I'm thinking, hoping people just think it's a nice little animal. Okay, anyway, let's move on. Um, nutrient cycling. We won't have time to talk about this, but this is a key interaction in uh, oceanic islands in particular, where basically birds through foraging on fish and sea creatures are bringing nutrients back up to land. And this is kind of a key um, cycle on those island ecosystems. And this brings up your next quiz, um, which is on the next slide. But those islands, uh, when they have massive colonies of seabirds, you can imagine the guano that accumulates there. And this was mined for fertilizer um, for many years until the artificial nitrogen fixation, the Haber-Bosch process was discovered and perfected in uh, around World War II. So your quiz is, why does Bolivia not have any oceanfront property? Ah, Matt Sharp Cheney got it. Matt Cheney, oh, I know Matt, yeah. Um, yeah, so let me go back to the slides here. The reason is, Bird guano. There were a series of wars over bird guano off the coast of South America. Bolivia used to have um, land all the way to the Pacific coast there, but it was taken over by Chile. Um, you can see the little sections that were gradually taken over there. All right, we we're rapidly running out of time. Um, so pollination is a very specialized thing in several bird groups. Um, again, not many species, but those that do it are highly specialized for that. Uh, one bit of useless trivia is there are bird uh, pollinated plants on all continents except Europe. There's only one species in Europe that occasionally eats nectar. Uh, and that is the black cap, which you wouldn't think is very well suited for that. Um, most agricultural crops are actually insect pollinated, um, but there's a few that are bird pollinated, things like uh, blueberries and things in that family, which are also pollinated by insects, but some pollinated by hummingbirds. Um, there aren't many experimental studies like the cage experiments I showed you earlier um, dealing with pollination, but there are natural experiments where uh, the pollinators have been either massively um, massively declined or extinct. And New Zealand is the poster child for bird extinction in this regard. And they have lots of plants that are primarily bird pollinated that have declined considerably um, since a lot of their native birds have gone extinct. There's some other natural experiments like a hurricane um, greatly decreasing the hummingbirds in the Bahamas and then you can count the, the fruit set the following year. Fruit set would be the result of a flower being pollinated and then producing the fruit. Um, so in the absence of hummingbirds or the lower density of hummingbirds, fruit set declined um, in similar studies. Okay, this is our last main topic. Uh, I'll try to do this quickly. Fruit eating birds, uh, this is probably the second most important thing birds do after eating insects and invertebrates, uh, at least in terms of the number of species. So about 1,500 species primarily eat fruit and then another you know, 2,500 or so eat fruit some of the time. So almost, you know, about 40% of all bird species. Um, I summarized the number of plants, or estimated actually, um, the number of plants that birds disperse, and it's you know, somewhere between 50 and 80,000. So that's you know, 20 to 25% of all seed plant species are probably dispersed by birds. Um, some of them are also dispersed by mammals and things too, but. Uh, 
There we go. So seed dispersal is important from the plant's perspective because it gets the seed and the seedling, if it survives, away from potential predators, seed predators and herbivores, away from competitors, which are its brothers and sisters from the same tree or from other individuals of the same species. Um, it can lead the seed to a suitable site for germination, um, which would in many cases is an open site that is without a plant already there. Uh, and sometimes it's more somewhat more specialized leading that certain dispersers will take seeds to the right places for that plant to grow. And then another advantage is of course gene flow in the population. A secondary uh, benefit of frugivory and seed dispersal is that it helps for some species it helps germination and this is usually um, more because it's removing the fruit pulp that inhibits germination rather than sort of any treatment in the gut as it passes through. Um, but again, it's, it's better for a, a fruit to be eaten than fall under the parent tree. So one example of this uh, is the um, three wattled bellbird up on the left there. These are kind of a ridiculous bird in uh, Central America. You can see those black things. There's three of those black fleshy things. Those are the wattles um, and that's the male. The males sit around on perches and do this bonk call and sometimes a little squeak along with it. Um, which is their call advertising for mates. They have what's called a lek system, in this case kind of an exploded lek, where the males have their display area uh, and the females go around and check out and pick what they think is the best male. So the point is that this bird, which eats fruit most of the time, 80% of its diet is fruit, is sitting on this perch most of the day uh, in the season, in the breeding season. And of course, because it eats a lot of fruit, it's regurgitating and defecating seeds under its, its favorite perch. Because it's trying to display, it's trying to be conspicuous, it picks open sites, uh, which is usually a dead tree or a, a dead branch hanging over a tree fall gap. And so that, for some plant species, that's a good situation because it's a highlight environment where they can uh, germinate and establish. And in, in one study, um, we compared seed dispersal by bellbirds and four other species. We tracked where they took the seeds and found that bellbirds dispersed seeds in a different pattern than the other species and that that pattern was good for, in this case, one particular tree uh, it's a tree in the avocado family called Pocatea andresiana. So basically mini avocados. Those fruits are um, about an inch and a half long. Um, so the tree fall gaps and snags, whoops, sorry about that, where the bellbirds have their perches um, are good places for the seedlings because they get less uh, incidence of fungal infections and they tend to grow a little bit higher in the highlight environment. So that's an example where um, a certain species is key to the dispersal uh, of a certain plant. A similar situation, if you kind of scale that up to different ecosystems, in many forest ecosystems, like on the right, um, the best places for plants to end up is a gap in the forest. And lots of studies have shown that gaps tend to be um, places that attract a lot of birds, including seed dispersing birds. In arid environments, it's just the opposite situation where you have um, what's called a nurse plant. That is one plant gets established and it creates a shaded, slightly moister environment that's the best place in an arid ecosystem for plants to grow. And there are a bunch of studies that have shown direct dispersal to nurse plants uh, in arid environments. Okay. 
And then there's some highly specialized systems like mistletoes. Uh, some of the mistletoes have fleshy fruits that are eaten by specific birds and the, they require the birds to disperse the seeds. They won't um, have any seedling survival or new individuals if they're not eaten and dispersed by birds. There's a whole elaborate system where there's this viscous uh, sticky stuff around the seed that um, the birds have to wipe off onto the branch to get rid of it. They can't just poop it out like normal. Um, so they have to wipe it off and the birds, as you can see in this picture, the bird is clinging onto the branch with its feet. Um, if you imagine that you have those kind of feet and you want to perch somewhere, you can imagine that a different size branch would be maybe more or less comfortable. Uh, and it turns out that for some species um, of mistletoe, they grow best on a certain diameter of branch that also is the diameter of branch that the birds like to perch on the most. So that's really cool. That's kind of an exception. Most seed dispersal systems are not that specialized. In fact, they're not really specialized at all. Um, and finally, the whole bunch of other birds disperse seeds that you wouldn't think of. So far, I've been talking about fleshy fruits, you know, things like um, blueberries, avocados, and things like that. Um, but it turns out that water birds, geese, ducks, shorebirds, even some rails and gulls, um, will disperse um, seeds of aquatic plants. And this is, they're not eating the fruits necessarily, they're eating the seeds or the, or the foliage, uh, and then inadvertently, or maybe on purpose, ingesting the seeds as well and dispersing them elsewhere. There's been a lot of recent work on that. It's a widespread system and it explains, uh, to some extent at least, why aquatic plants like this have such wide geographic distributions. Um, another example of importance of seed dispersal or scatter hoarding by things like Clark's Nutcracker and Pinion, um, Pinion Jays, uh, mostly pines and oaks. And again, there's lots of examples of directed dispersal where particularly with the Nutcracker, they take seeds to the, some of the best places uh, where they can germinate. In the absence of Nutcrackers, uh, those white bark pines and things will have next to no recruitment. And then uh, there aren't many exclosure experiments, but like with the pollinators, there are natural experiments where the dispersers um, are gone for one reason or another. And again, these show that in the absence of dispersers, uh, like in fragmented forests, that many fewer uh, seeds will get removed from the tree, many fewer seedlings uh, will survive. So it's clear that from an ecological standpoint, um, seed dispersal is, is a very important ecological process. Um, I think we should probably stop because I've gone way over my time. Um, and so skip all this and get to your next quiz, the final quiz. Uh, should be coming up here soon. There, okay. So this is, into the cultural section. Name these four cultural references, and if you can, what species of bird is depicted. And then after this, we can we can go into questions. There we go. Yeah, people are getting Swan Lake. Aesop's Fables is the bottom right. Um, yeah, the top left one is probably the hardest. Oh, red crown crane in Japan, that's right. Um, and the, okay, so the top left one is a Japanese folktale called the Crane Wife, um, which I only knew about because the band, the Decembers, have a song about that, and I was curious and looked it up. <laughs> um, the bottom left is uh, Swan Lake, the top right is uh, Hitchcock's The Birds, which is totally fake, so if you haven't seen it, don't bother. And then the bottom right is uh, The Crow in Aesop's Fables. Um, yeah, so I think 
Serena, I think I should stop here, and if anyone has questions, we can do those. Uh, Deneen had some questions. So back when you were talking about um, uh, birds eating insects and being um, insecticides, essentially, Deneen said, this reminds me of traditional planting methods like the hedgerows in England or the rose vines outside wineries that get the blight first and the old windbreaks that used to be in the Salinas Valley. Did they encourage birds and insect control? Yeah, absolutely. Um, having a bird habitat next to the crop field is the way to go. In the, in the Midwest these days, it's corn is, is fence line to fence line. There's no hedgerows in most of the area. Um, but in areas where you can, where you have the choice, of providing habitat near crops or intercropping, uh, it can have a big impact. Um, Deneen also said, and this I think is in reference to the soybeans, um, Deneen asked, would Japanese birds have done better, I guess in terms of insect control of the, of the soybean plants? <clears throat> Japanese birds? Yeah, I'm assuming it's because uh, with soybeans originating in Japan, maybe? Ah, uh, interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Um, I kind of doubt it. I mean, the agricultural soybeans are pretty far removed from anything that the original birds would remember. Um, but, you know, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, because soybeans not native. Well, I mean, corn isn't really either. Uh, it's from farther south. Um, but yeah, that's a valid question because a lot of the crop pests are not necessarily native either. Um, yeah, I don't know if other species would do differently or if it, if it would be a different situation uh, where soybeans are closer to their uh, original source. That's a good question. Um, related to that, Ronnie asked if if there was no grain yield drop in soybeans, why was there a negative dollar amount calculated as a disservice? Well, that was in year one. So in year one, she did find an effect on crop yield, but in year two, she didn't find it. Um, Deneen also asked, and I think this is in relation to guano, um, Janine asks, were explosives involved? Uh, in mining it? I don't know how they mined it. I mean, it's on the surface, so I imagine they could just dig it up. Okay. Um, Ronnie asked, what caused loss of bird species in New Zealand? And Chris Lewis responded that um, a lot of birds were lost because of introduced predators, such as stoats, possums and rodents. And Dan, is there anything else you want to add to that? That's pretty much the story on islands in general. Uh, introduced predators and to some, sometimes like in Hawaii, avian malaria that's spread by mosquitoes. Um, snakes on Guam uh, have done a number on the native birds there. Yeah. Vivian asked, does gizzard action affect some seeds? Uh, it, yeah, it potentially does. Um, in, in, more, uh, in more serious seed-eating birds, it crushes the seeds. But in, in more fruit-based diets, or birds have um, more gentle gizzards, and so it will strip off the fruit pulp, um, but not affect the seed. There are some examples where um, gut passage is thought to enhance germination by some sort of scarification, but it's not clear if that's in the gizzard or just from the digestive juices. Um, Judy asked where you got your vulture plushie. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm not actually sure. That's the kind of thing my mom gives me because I'm the bird nerd in the family. So kind of any bird related thing I end up with. 
Um, I'm not sure. I, I can try to find out, I suppose. Um, Deborah asked, are any birds helpful in the locust plague in Eastern Africa? Um, well, they don't have California gulls there. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I mean, whenever there's a massive outbreak of stuff, birds will start to eat it. And when there's, you know, cicadas uh, in more in eastern North America, lots of birds will, will swarm in and eat those. So I'm sure there's things that, that will eat those. Um, whether or not they're going to control them to the extent that the California gulls did is, a, you know, I don't know about that. Uh, Jan asked, who are our main local frugivores? Um, American Robin, Cedar Waxwing, um, Bantail Pigeon to some extent. Um, a lot of other birds eat fruit occasionally, uh, especially during migration and in the fall. Um, let's see, any others? You know, mockingbirds eat a fair amount of fruit. Um, those are the main ones. The, in general, um, the thrushes, mockingbird group, um, and the cedar waxwings are the main ones. And then other um, migratory, generally insectivorous birds uh, will also eat, eat some fruit. Elaine said that was a great presentation. Will there be another time to view the slides that you had to zip through? I don't know. That's up to uh, the powers that be, I guess. <laughs> I mean, we can post them somewhere. Yeah, if you can send me the slides, I'm happy to post up a PDF afterwards. Thanks, Elaine. Um, all right. Yeah, thanks again so much, everybody. It's been a pleasure, and we hope to see you next week. Yeah, thanks everybody.